Hello, I am Alon Bernstein, visiting assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and Israel Institute fellow at the University of California, Irvine, here bringing you the summary of the last 24 hours of the Israel-Hamas war. It is currently the eve of November 21st, 2023 in the United States, the morning of November 22nd, 2023 in the Middle East. Starting with the hostage situation, after 46 days of the war, a deal has been reached between Israel and Hamas to secure the release of some of the people that were kidnapped on October 7th in exchange for the release of Palestinian prisoners held in Israel, in Israel and a slew of several other things. The deal was mediated by Qatar, Egypt, and the United States. According to the deal, 50 Israeli women and minors who were kidnapped on October 7th will be released over a four-day period. Hamas is going to transfer to Israel the night before each of those days the list of people who are going to be released. It is unclear how many people will be released each day. This will include a four-day pause in the war in which there will be no fighting. In addition, Israel will release three Palestinian prisoners, specifically women and minors, for every Israeli hostage that is released. The list of Palestinians that Israel will release does not include anyone who was convicted of murder. According to the deal, the Israeli hostages will be released at the morning of each day, then there will be a day of pause, and then the Palestinian prisoners will be released from Israeli jails in the evenings. Included in the deal, Israel will avoid any aerial activity in the Gaza Strip, for six hours each day during the pause, during which time Hamas is going to round up and locate and catalog all of the hostages that are held by different organizations or even individuals. In addition, during each day of pause, entering into the Gaza Strip, in addition to the usual contingent of humanitarian trucks, are going to be four fuel trucks, four trucks of natural gas, and 200 trucks of additional humanitarian aid carrying food, water, and medical supplies. According to reports, the deal is supposed to commence on Thursday morning. In addition, it was reported that if Hamas manages to locate and round up other women and children who fit the categories of who is to be released, they can be released as the days go on. According to the reports, if Hamas releases more hostages, it will re receive three Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails for each hostage that is released. And if in each day they release an additional 10 hostages, they will earn themselves, quote-unquote, another day of pause. Regarding to, relating to the identity of the hostages that will be released, there are a total of 40 minors, i.e. children, and 58 Israeli women that are held by Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad that were kidnapped on October 7th, a total of 98 names that were transferred to Hamas and meet, the, meet these criteria. According to the reports, in the initial release of 50, there are going to be 30 children, eight mothers, and 12 additional women. The reason that that does not satisfy all of the children, but instead there's 12 additional women, is that Hamas is claiming that the other mothers and children are being held by other organizations, and thus they have added 12 women to the list in order to reach the minimum of 50 that Israel required. According to Israel, Hamas knows the location of up to 75 of these 98 women and children, and that the rest are held by other organizations, but Hamas can apply pressure on them in order to possibly release them. In addition, relating to the identity of those who are going to be released, no female soldiers, so the IDF soldiers that were kidnapped on October 7th, are going to be released. There are specifically five female IDF soldiers. They are not included in this deal. It is also reported that the deal only includes Israeli citizens and not specifically those foreign citizens like Thai citizens or Nate police that were kidnapped. Also, there is suspicion in Israel that Hamas may release these regardless of, this, of the deal, as a result of negotiations that the organization is currently conducting with the Thai government mediated by Iran. In addition, both sides reported additional facets of the deal beyond what was published initially. Specifically, Prime Minister Netanyahu, when he was talking to the cabinet, stated that the deal includes a guarantee that the Red Cross will be able to visit the remaining hostages that are held in captivity in the Gaza Strip and supply them with medication. In turn, Hamas stated the deal includes that Israel will stop all aerial activity throughout the southern parts of the Gaza Strip for the entire four days of pause, and in addition, that traffic will be allowed to move north in the Gaza Strip on the Salah Hadin Road. The Salah Hadin Road is the main highway in the Gaza Strip that Israel has been calling Palestinians to evacuate down south. According to Hamas, the deal also includes that Palestinians will be able to return north. This was not part of the initial deal, as was published. Regarding some of the political developments around the deal, the Israeli Defense Forces and the Shabak, equivalent to Israeli FBI, were in full support of the deal and they emphasized that the fighting will continue after the pause is completed. There was a lot of political turmoil in Israel, specifically 
the Jewish Power Party of Ben Gvir and the Religious Zionism Party of Vitalik Smotrich both were against the deal. However, Religious Zionism did end up voting for the deal in cabinet. Jewish Power voted against the deal. In addition, it was reported that related to the hostages that thousands of Palestinian doctors suddenly received a text message from the IDF urging them that if they have any information about hostages, that they should come forth, promising them secrecy and, I'm quoting, a new life for you and your family. Moving on to the ongoing fighting that is still continuing in the Gaza Strip. There were continuous barrages of rockets and missiles today, pummeling the south of Israel and the central parts of the country. Rockets targeted in Ashkelon, the entire area surrounding Gaza and the Saad area. There was a substantial barrage to the Shvila area, a direct hit of shrapnel in Nisziona, as well as rockets that targeted Rishon Lutzion and Ber Yaakov. The Israeli Defense Forces, the IDF, reported they carried out over 250 air raids in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours. In addition, the IDF reported it is currently completing its surrounding of Jabalia, which is the last city not taken over in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. Substantial fighting is reported in these areas, including in the underground tunnels, and that Jabalia, along with its associated neighborhoods of Sajaiya, are the last places in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip that the IDF has not fully taken over. In addition, it was reported today that communications in the northern part of the Gaza Strip have collapsed as a result of communications towers in, the Ga in Gaza City being attacked, so different than previous times when communications fell. This was as a result of a bombing. In addition, it was reported of intensive fighting around the Al Uda hospital in the northern part of the Gaza Strip, and the three staff members there were reported killed. In other reports, a substantial bombing was reported today in the Hamid neighborhood of Hanunis, so this is the m biggest city in the southern part of the Gaza Strip. Uh, specifically, an apartment was attacked. There are reports of upwards of 10 people being killed and 22 people being injured. Unclear who was the target of this attack. The Palestinian Wafa network is also reporting of substantial bombing that occurred in the New Sirat area. This is an area in the central parts of the Gaza Strip. The IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, today reported that they may soon allow Israeli citizens to return to the towns within the four kilometer radius of the Gaza Strip. So this is roughly two and a half miles radius of the Gaza Strip. All the towns in the area have been evacuated since October 7th. This tells us something about the way the IDF is at least perceiving how the war is progressing, that Israeli citizens may be allowed to return to their homes within that two and a half mile, give or take, or four kilometer radius. Regarding casualties, the IDF is reporting three soldiers that were killed in the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours and several were badly injured, bringing the total number of soldiers that were killed in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began to 69. The Palestinian Advocacy Ministry in the Gaza Strip is now updating the numbers of Palestinians that have been killed. Specifically, they cited that number since the war began at 14,128 Palestinians that have been killed since the war began. Among these, upwards of 5,800 are minors. Again, I will state, as I have stated every day, the Palestinian Health Ministry is no longer reporting those numbers. The United Nations is no longer reporting the numbers because they got their numbers officially from the Palestinian Health Ministry for over a week now. The Palestinian Health Ministry has not reported any numbers. These are numbers that are being reported by a different ministry. Therefore, unclear how reliable they are exactly because it is not the official numbers of the Palestinian Health Ministry. Moving on to the humanitarian situation, the Jordanian Prime Minister today stated that Israel ordered Jordan to evacuate one of the field hospitals that it set up in the southern parts of the Gaza Strip and that Jordan is refusing to do so. The addition, the Prime Minister stated that in, other, in relation to other incidences in which Jordanian medical staff were injured in the Gaza Strip, that, and I'm quoting, the peace treaty with Israel is just a piece of paper gathering dust if Israel does not honor it. In addition, relating to medical staff in the Gaza Strip, the World Health Organization today reported that three different hospitals, Al-Shifa, Al-Ahli, and the Indonesian hospital, all located in northern parts of the Gaza Strip, have appealed to the organization in order to help them carry out a full evacuation. The IDF is reporting that 95% of Palestinian civilians in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip have evacuated down south, and that the IDF is attempting to evacuate the rest of them from the Zaytun, Sajaiya, and Jabalia area. In addition, it was reported today by the IDF that even if the IDF does expand its fighting down south, Palestinian civilians are not going to be permitted to move north, and this relates to the statement of Hamas saying that the pause does include that Palestinians will be able to move north. The IDF stated more generally that even if the fighting does expand down south, there will not be permitted for Palestinian civilians to move north, and there will be other humanitarian areas that are safe spaces in the down south area. Presumably, this is referring to the Muasi area right by the coast in the southern parts of the Gaza Strip. A total of 79 trucks carrying food, water, and medical supplies are reported to have passed into the Gaza Strip in the last 24 hours, in addition to the two trucks carrying upwards of 60,000 liters of fuel that also passed in. 
Moving on to the West Bank, there was substantial IDF activity reported in the Balata refugee camp near Nablus and in Kfarburka. Several confrontations with Palestinians throwing Molotov cocktails were reported and several Palestinians were injured. In addition, there was an earlier report in the day that a Palestinian, 17-year-old, in the Balata refugee camp was killed as a result of confrontations with the IDF. In addition, right before recording this, reports came in of substantial IDF activity in the Tulkarim area, specifically surrounding the Thabit Thabit Hospital. A total of 26 Palestinians were arrested throughout the West Bank in the last 24 hours. Moving on to the northern parts of Israel, the southern parts of Lebanon, it was a very, very intensive day. There were barrages of rockets and missiles and mortar fires were fired from Lebanon into areas of the Upper Galilee and Western Galilee. Specifically, they targeted the areas of Shlomi in the Western Galilee, Kiryat Shmona. There was also reported substantial drone attacks towards the Kibbutz Dan, Sneer, and Ajar in the Upper Galilee area. There were specific note of attack drones that were intercepted in the Hanita and Naharia area. An RPG managed, managed to hit a house in Menra and in Avivim, as well as in Metula, and also targeted several different IDF outposts. Mortar fires also landed in the Kibbutz Baram area. The IDF carried out substantial retaliations against Hezbollah targets and different attack units. Al Manar and Al Jazeera both reported the IDF drone, drone attacks that were carried out in the Anakura and Alavona areas in southern Lebanon and that there were other attacks carried out against different Hezbollah outposts throughout southern Lebanon. It was reported today that Khalil Harez, who is the deputy leader of the al Qassam Brigades, which is Hamas's military brigades in Lebanon, was assassinated. His car was attacked in the Tzur area with an attack drone, most likely, and alongside him, three more seniors in the organization were killed. In addition, there are reports in Lebanon that upwards of eight people were killed in different IDF retaliations today among these two reporters. It was later reported in the El Miyadin network that the two reporters that were killed were affiliated with this network. Moving on to the regional developments, the U.S. National Security Council spokesperson Nate John Kirby stated that it is possible that the Wagner Group, affiliated with Russia, is going to soon start providing Iranian militias, including Hezbollah, with equipment and anti-air support. So it was reported already several weeks ago, that there is concern that Hezbollah is going to get from the Wagner Group different aerial support and anti-aircraft missiles. Now th the U.S. National Security Council is also stating there is growing concern that more broadly Iranian militias in the region are going to be armed by the Wagner Group. Remains to be seen how this develops. Moving on to the political and general trends today, South African Parliament voted overwhelmingly in favor of closing the Israeli embassy and severing relations with Israel. I will note, however, that this is mostly a declarative statement. The parliament does not actually have the authority to do this and it remains up to the government. The Saudi Arabian foreign ministry today stated that what Israel is doing in Gaza cannot be justified as self-defense. Saudi Arabia called for the immediate ceasefire in the region, the entrance of substantial humanitarian aid, the release of all hostages unconditionally, and to initiate a serious peace process in order to resolve the Palestinian issue. In addition, President Biden today was asked about the brewing hostage deal. This was before the deal was actually agreed upon. And he stated, and I quote, I welcome the deal to release hostages that were abducted by the terror organizations in its brutal attack against Israel on October 7th, adding that he personally is committed to the complete release of all U.S. citizens that are held by Hamas. According to different reports, those included in the potential identity of the people who are going to be released, the women and children, include three U.S. citizens that are held by the organization. There are other U.S. citizens that are not included in those criterion right now. Moving on to speculations regarding the future of the Gaza Strip, the Secretary General of the United Nations today stated that the number of children that have been killed in the Gaza Strip is unprecedented since he took office in 2017. He was then asked about the future of the Gaza Strip, and he rejected the idea that the U.N. will govern the Gaza Strip, and he stated, and I quote, Everyone must unite to create the conditions for a strengthened Palestinian authority to take responsibility for Gaza. So after both the United States and the EU have said that their official position is that some sort of strength and revitalize the United Palestinian Authority is going to govern the Gaza Strip, the UN is now stating that officially as well. In addition, the Minister of Intelligence in Israel, Gila Gamliel, today published an article in the Jerusalem Post in which she promoted her office's plan that was published several weeks after the war began. Her office was the first one in Israel to publish some plan for what will be the future of the Gaza Strip. She called for the forcible evacuation of Palestinians from the Gaza Strip to the Sinai Peninsula and towards Egypt. Today, she defended that plan in her opinion piece, and she called for, and I'm quoting, promote the voluntary resettlement of Palestinians in Gaza for humanitarian reasons outside of the Gaza Strip. When the Israeli embassy in the United States was asked about this, the embassy stated that the opinions of the Minister of Intelligence only represent herself and do not represent the government. 
And finally, I'm just going to reiterate some of the fine points that I said about the deal at the beginning of the summary. It is supposed to start on Thursday morning. It is going to include the release of a minimum of 50 Israeli women and children, specifically mothers and children and additional women, in exchange for roughly 150 Palestinian prisoners in Israeli jails. This may increase as more hostages are released. It is important to note several things. The pause of four days in the fighting only includes the Gaza Strip. It does not include the northern parts of Israel, and it does not include if there's any flare-ups in the West Bank. And also, the pause right now that's agreed upon is only four days. After that, the fighting is supposed to continue. Technically, the pause can be extended. If Hamas releases upward of 10 additional hostages per day, the pause can be extended. That is my report for the last 24 hours. I'll be back tomorrow.